little town whose name is no longer remembered, there lived a lonely one who had wandered in many lands and among many people, searching for the answer to the riddle of life. He had prayed again and again to be entrusted with that light which alone can dispel the shadows from the hearts of men. He had asked to be tried, to have the opportunity to prove his worth before his God and his fellow men. But the passing years left his soul in darkness, and the truths his spirit longed for ever eluded his search. It chanced that on a certain evening, he wandered far away from the little home in the valley, on the outskirts of that nameless village where he had taken up his abode. Above that valley, hidden among the hills, mighty mountains raised their heads to touch the deep blue of the sky. Looking up, he was amazed to see a little star of light shining out clearly from the highest point of the snow-capped ridge. At the same instant, a voice within him whispered, that he should climb to that lofty peak. It told him that this little flame which flickered throughout the eventide was the light that he had sought in his pilgrimage through the world below. While he gazed upward, his heart grew faint within him, for great cliffs rose steeply from the valley. Not even a bird could find space to build a nest on their precipitous walls. The tops of the mountains were white with the snow that never melted. Chilly glaciers glistened like precious stones, even when the valley below was parched and withered by the heated winds of summer. The pilgrim determined to ascend the mountain, and hour after hour trudged along, his eyes fixed on the little light above. Drawing close to the foot of the cliff, he discovered to his great joy that a tiny path led up around the rocks. A twisting byway which could not be seen from below and which might never have been found had he not first resolved to climb the sheer precipices at any cost. Picking up a dead branch for a staff, the pilgrim mounted slowly this broken path around jagged rocks and over heaps of earth where the rains had caused the disintegrating cliffs to collapse upon the road. He soon realized that he was leaving the little village far below. The distant lights of the hamlet gleamed brightly in the darkness, while the purple shadows concealed in their misty depths the world that he had known. While climbing, the wanderer kept looking to the top of the peak, where the lonely little light shone ever more brightly as he drew nearer to its gleaming heart. But the glowing spark would burn there was itself a miracle, and the pilgrim could not help wondering what could be the source of the light and what purpose it served. Surely, he reasoned, that is not a fire, nor can it shine from the window of a house, for no one can live on the top of this mountain with nothing but ice and snow and the chilly blasts of eternal winter. It's too lonely, too cold, too desolate. Yet the beam is there. He rubbed his eyes. Can this be some trick of the imagination, he asked himself, looking again. Still the light shone. Day came and went. The second night found the pilgrim on a little plateau where he rested at the edge of the snow line, contemplating the mountains which stood like hoary patriarchs, raising their heads in adoration to their maker. Some rose far higher than others, and he counted six of these great peaks beside the one on the slope of which he stood. Amazement filled his heart, for on the very top of each flickered a solitary flame. Many times in the years that had passed, the wanderer, as a youth, had climbed among these cliffs and scaled these mountains, but never before had he seen those lights which gleamed like jewels in the diadems of kings. Filled with desire to solve the mystery, 
The wayfarer climbed the narrow path with renewed vigor, creeping along shelves of rock where one misstep would have meant destruction. Cliffs towered above him and deep canyons yawned below. As he mounted higher, the air grew chilly and he could see snow among the crevices about him. The cold blast from the glaciers caused him to shiver and draw his garments more closely about him. The light he sought grew ever brighter, and now each footstep brought nearer the gleaming star that he had wandered so far to find. The pilgrim soon began to distinguish a solitary figure standing on the very crest of the highest glacier, holding aloft a lighted lamp. Coming closer, he saw the form was that of an old man, robed from head to foot in flowing garments, which the wind sweeping among the cliffs blew out in trails of white. His sandaled feet were in the snow, and his head was bent forward as he leaned upon an ancient staff cut from some mystic tree, mayhap even from the tree of life itself. The traveler could see that the old man was weary, for he swayed and seemed about to fall, but the arm holding the light never wavered. In the lamp of old and tarnished brass burned a mysterious flame, and from that flickering light thousands of little rays like winged creatures streamed forth to disappear in the darkness of the great unknown. As the pilgrim watched, he realized that these rays in an endless processional swept round the world. At last, breathless from his long climb, chilled by the darkness and cold, shrouded in a night that knew no day, with even the lights of the village screened from his view by a seething mass of clouds, the pilgrim reached the lonely figure. Seeing the traveler approaching, the aged man raised his noble head, crowned with silver, and his great kindly eyes, second only in their brilliance to the light he carried, were turned upon the pilgrim. My son, he called in a deep, mellow voice, what seekest thou here amid these mountain peaks in the darkness of such a night as this? The wanderer answered, I saw the light you held while I was down in the valley, and have come to ascertain what it was. The old man, gazing lovingly at his little lamp, replied, The light thou seest is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The light I carry is the life of men. In me thou seest one of those who hath dedicated his soul to the light. I am one of the silent watchers who through the darkness of ignorance and the night of men hold aloft this beacon which showeth that God still keepeth his trust with his children. There are but seven sparks which light the whole world. Under many names men worship them, and under many forms he honoreth them. But know this, they are but lights held in the hands of the compassionate ones. Thou seest them gleaming through the darkness on yonder mountain peaks. What mountains are these that surround us? asked the pilgrim. And why stand you here alone? These are the lofty mountains, the high places of the world, which are always concealed from the world below by clouds and mists answered the old man. We are the sleepless watchers of the destiny of worlds. We stand on these lofty mountains that all the world may have these sparks of life. My torch was lighted on the altar of Cosmos and has never gone out. I have stood here since the dawn of time, since these mountains rose from the darkness of chaos. Faithful to these children of men, whose eyes have designed the mountain peaks, from whence cometh their light. 
Are you not lonely here and let the ice and snow? Yea, verily, answered the old man, a strange, sad look in his eyes. We are ever alone. We are the seven watchers through the nights of human ignorance. The compassionate sons of humanity are our lords and masters. Here through the ages we stand. We are the lonely ones. And these mountain tops are our homes. But surely, Father, others will come to relieve your vigil that you may rest, and they will hold aloft your lamp. Alas, my son, for ages we have waited, but none will hold our lights. But surely some come to help you, some climb these mountains. Yes, replied the keeper of the lamp. The path has been worn smooth by many feet, but when those who come here felt the cold chill of the night on the mountain top, heard the sighs of the wind chilled by the breath of glaciers, they stayed but a little while. Then they drew the folds of their garments about them and returned again to the valley below. It is too cold, too lonely, too silent. There is no glory in carrying this light, no honor in the sight of men, no reward but the endless vigil. You indeed will even try to keep alight this solitary flame. The pilgrim thought for a few moments, his heart too full for words. At last he turned to the old man, saying, Father, let me hold your lamp. Let me keep aloft your beacon light that those upon the other mountains shall know that you have been true to your trust. The lonely one raised his head, and his great eyes gazed long and searchingly at the pilgrim. Then he pointed upward to the skies, where far above the mountain tops the orbs of heaven shone down in silent glory, and the great procession of the stars marched on through the night in perpetual pageantry. The old sentinel spoke, his voice thrilling with an eloquence divine. Yonder, my son, thou seest the lamps that light the heavens. Each distant spark that shines forth signifies the pact between the Creator and his creation, that it has not been broken. When I have found someone to carry my light, to stand in my place faithful and true, I will journey to the stars, from the corners of the heavens, from the mystic arches of creation, voices call. The fires upon unnumbered altars must be kept burning through the darkness of creation's sleep. When one of earth is found to bear this flame, then indeed do the children of the heavens rejoice, and the one who is freed goeth forth to hold a greater light. The pilgrim bowed his head in thought, and at last, walking over to the lonely figure, humbly said, Father, I will carry the light. My hand shall hold it aloft, for you are old and I am young. Give me the lamp. I swear that I will serve it and feed it with all the love and compassion of my soul. The face of the aged man lit up for a moment, and he gave the lamp to the pilgrim. My blessings are with you, my son. For while thy spirit is willing, beware lest the flesh be weak. For ages, no one but myself has held the light. Since first these mountains came, I alone have supported it, watched it, protected it. For if its flickering gleams die out, with them fails the light in the souls of men. We have never broken faith with man, know it one another, and through the dim ages that have passed, when even our names were used to curse our brother, we silent seven have loved those who have betrayed us, served those who have denied us, and illumined those who have ridiculed us. Do thou likewise, for thou art no longer one of earth. I go to other works. Slowly the white-robed figure turned, and walked away over the crunching snow, growing smaller and smaller in the distance.
the watching pilgrim saw the feeble figure with its flowing beard leaning heavily upon its staff reached the very edge of the great cliff that rose from the valley below. Then the old man glided off into the sky and with one last wave of the hand passed gradually from sight amidst the stars of the firmament. It seemed that the lights of heaven shone brighter as he vanished among them while the beacons on the mountain swayed and gleamed with a more glorious splendor. The pilgrim filled with the radiance of his ideal, stood holding the lamp, his heart filled with purest sentiments and noblest purposes. He felt the majesty and the power that comes to one of the guardians of creation. The greatest and grandest in his nature spoke. The unselfish purpose of his labor thrilled him with life and hope. So he stood, the winds and the snows beating against him, great rumblings and roarings as of avalanches shooting down the mountainside, the crackling of glaciers and the howl of wolves broke the silence of his vigil. The hours passed, his arm grew weary, and he too swayed upon his staff with fatigue. But for reasons unknown he could not lower the light. His fingers seemed fastened to the lamp, which glowed steadily in spite of his trembling arm. The chill of the snow came upon him, which only those know who have faced death amidst these silent, silvery wastes. A great fear by degrees invaded the heart of the pilgrim. Must he stand upon the mountain top forever? Would that night never have an end? Would the sun never shine again? The years rolled on, and ages were counted with the dead, but still the watcher now old and gray himself, held the light upon the mountain top. But it was no longer with exultation in his heart, no longer for love of his task. His eyes were fixed longingly on the valleys below. His mind fashioned again and again pictures of the things he had known. Smiling faces of those he had left behind forever kept forming in the reeling mist which eternally surrounded him. He had begun to feel what it was to be apart. He was alone in a great silence, broken only by nature's sounds. He prayed that he might hear a human voice. His mind reeled. His brain grew hazy. And there was but one thought. He must leave that fearful place. He could not, would not, stand there through all eternity. He had not the strength to face the lonely, friendless ages which stretched out before him. Slowly his agony consumed him until he raved at the very light he bore, dying for friendship and love, solitary on the mountaintop. He cursed the very hour that had brought him into being. Little by little the flame in his hand grew dim as the spark of truth in his own soul died until even the friendliness of its warming glow was denied him. Yet he could not escape. He could not move. He must remain with his self-appointed task. He prayed unto God for mercy. He begged that the powers of darkness release him. But still he stood there alone in the fields of snow, bearing aloft the light, which grew feebler every day. At last the great despair seized him, the despair that many have felt, the helplessness, the hopelessness without end. He pitied the lonely watcher whose place he had taken. He was conscious of the gray beard on his own cheek. He thought of the years of life which he felt were wasted. Then his eyes turned to the other mountains on whose peaks the light still gleamed, and in spite of his great anguish, his heart went out to them. Suddenly, after what seemed an eternity, his soul was filled with joy and his life welled up again. For returning through the sky, he saw the white-robed form of the silent watcher. Like a drifting shadow of night, the aged figure walked across the arch of heaven and finally placed his sandaled foot 
upon the crunching snow of the mountain, and staff in hand, reached the side of the lonely one. My son, through cosmos has come the call. Thou art not strong enough to carry the burden that thou wouldst. Too soon thou camest up the mountain, but it is still within thy power to choose. Wilt thou keep the light? Wilt thou be true to it through the ages? O oh, Father, I cannot. It is so lonely, nothing to think of, no one to talk to. If I stay longer, I shall go mad. Already my eyes have seen things not of earth, strange creatures, visions of delirium. The solitude, the silence, the darkness speaks to me with a thousand tortured tongues. O oh God, I cannot stay. Father, take the light, lest it go out. The old man grasped the lamp, and as his fingers closed over its handle, the dying spark gleamed forth with renewed life, while the rays streamed out again to every corner of the world. The broken-hearted one, relieved of his burden, fell disconsolate at the feet of the aged philosopher. A moment later he rose with one idea in his mind, to escape from that terrible place. With his face between his hands, half crazed with terror and despair, he rushed headlong down the mountain. He even feared to turn back and look at the light, but at last he found courage to do so, and the tears came to his eyes as he saw the lonely figure of the silent watcher, his long gray beard still lying upon his chest, his head bowed upon his staff, his right hand holding aloft the light of the world. Oh, Father, he sobbed, I would that I could stay. Now I know what you have suffered. I know what the lonely ones have endured. I know the price that must be paid by the saviors of the world. But I cannot stay. I am not ready. I have not the understanding which would fill the emptiness of my solitude. Turning, he dashed, half running, half falling, heedless of cliff and gully, down into the mist that hid the world below. It seemed days before he reached the village he had left, but when he did so a cry burst from his lips. Happy faces no longer thronged the street, laughing voices no longer rang. The hamlet was deserted. Only a heap of ruin remained. So he wandered forth over hill and plain, searching for those he had loved. But during the ages he had stood upon the mountain peak, all whom he had known had passed away. The things that to him had once been dear were now but shams and follies. Although he had returned to the world, he was not of the world, for his soul was still on the mountain top, holding the light. For years he searched, but he could neither find the happiness he sought, nor the mountain that touched the sky. He could not find the seven lights that gleamed from their ragged cliffs, though now he played for them as fervently as once he had begged to be freed from their service. At last, upon a dusty roadway, which for many years he had been traveling, the lonely pilgrim sank to rise no more. Broken in mind and body, aged with sorrow and suffering, the soul within at last waited liberation. A fellow wanderer on the great path found him there, the last spark of light still gleaming faintly in the dying form. Brother, whispered the pilgrim, his eyes a far away look in them as he gazed into the darkness of the night. Can you see above you seven lights shining in the sky on the crests of the eternal mountains? The wayfarer turned and looked. No, I can see nothing, he answered, holding the dying form in his arms. I can, whispered the feeble voice. The expiring man held out his arms to the sky, and half rising, his faith illuminated with divine glory, he cried out, Father, Father, I come back to carry the light. Go again to the stars that call you with their beckoning lanterns in the sky. Tell them you need never return. 
for this time I shall not fail. The form sank back, while somewhere on the crest of the mountains, a spirit that at last had climbed the height, took again the light to hold it forever, its rays bright with the glory of his own unfolded gold.